Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day, fathers. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. My name's Matt. Uh, I'm the minister here at North. We are going to be in John chapter 4, so if you want to flip there, stick a thumb in it, that's where we are going to land here today. We're glad that you're here with us. Uh, dads, fathers, mothers, everybody, we're glad that you're joining us this morning. We're going to take a pause today from what we have been studying the last several weeks. We've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' sermon in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're going to take a pause from that a little bit, and today we're going to dive into the faith of a specific father that we find in Scripture. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to do that together here this morning. Uh, as we talk about Father's Day, and as we look at fathers around us, Father's Day can bring up a wide range of emotions for us at times, can't it? Like, like maybe you fall into the camp of, you know, this day brings really good, positive feelings for us. Uh, you fall into the camp of, you, you know, having a great relationship with your dad. You have a great relationship with your kids. And so Father's Day is really a celebration. But not everybody falls into that camp, unfortunately. Some people, when they think about Father's Day, it just... Uh, arouses these, these kind of negative, hurtful feelings because of the relationship you have with your dad or because of the relationship that you have with your kids. Or you could fall into the camp of Father's Day is just a struggle because you recently lost dad. You recently lost that father figure in your life. I lost, many of you know, I lost my dad in November. And so this day, although I have great relationship with my kids, like that, that's going to be a celebration today, uh, this is also a uh, a kind of mixed emotion day for me as well. So no matter where you land in that, this morning, we want to encourage you, dads. We want to encourage you as, as you are living out this role of father in, uh, in your kids' lives. I'm a dad. Many of you have seen my kids run around this place and own this place uh, on Sunday mornings. You laugh like uh, it's just a coping me me mechanism for you. <laughs> I have four kids, uh, eight, six uh, eight, six, four, and two. I almost forgot it there. That would have been horrible. Uh, eight, six, four, and two. I have two girls on the ends and, and two very dominant boys in the middle. Uh, here's what I know, and you know this, right? Like if you've been a dad for more than five seconds, you know that parenting uh, and fatherhood is not always easy, right? It is not for the faint of heart. Being a parent is just not that easy all the time. I, I, I connect with, don't judge me, okay? I connect with the title of one, one of Dr. James Dobson's books. Uh, I feel like it's really appropriate for parenting, and maybe you've heard this. Parenting is not for cowards. Like, I connect with that because at times I just want to, like, duck out. Like, I'm just being honest here, okay? I know you don't struggle with that, but his book, Parenting is Not for Cowards, I, I connect with. And the reality is that being a father or a mother or a grandparent, or a guardian, or a parent of any kind is difficult. Like, it is not always easy. It brings its challenges. You may, you may have heard the story of the three-year-old and his dad that went to the store on the way home to pick up a few groceries. And they're walking through the store, like most dads do, because they don't know where anything is. They're kind of walking aimlessly. Oh, it's just me? This judge? Okay, that's fine. So we're walking, you're, they're walking aimlessly, this is not my story, <laughs> promise. Uh, they're walking aimlessly through the store trying to find the few things that they need and the three-year-old is just not having any of it, he wants some candy. And, and in each of the aisles, they are passing the same other shopper that is, that is uh, doing her, her shopping there. And so the first time that they pass this shopper, little, uh, the little child is, is sitting there asking for a candy bar, just repeatedly. And, and the dad is sitting there going, now, Billy, this won't take too long. Just hang in there. And the next aisle, they pass the, the same shopper. The, the boy has increased his cry uh, to a louder plea for the candy. And, and dad is just there again saying, Billy, you need to calm down. We'll be done here in just a minute. In the third aisle, the boy begins to scream uncontrollably. I know you've never been there with kids, Kay. I have. That's just... We're, we're at here. Screaming uncontrollably, Dad is still keeping his cool in this moment. He says, Billy, settle down. We're almost out of here. And then they reach the checkout just ahead of 
the shop of the other shopper, the dad keeping his cool, he checks out the few things that they have, and the boy by this point is kicking and screaming because he's not getting his candy bar, and you hear the dad say, Billy, we, are, we will be in the car in just a minute. Everything will be fine. The other shopper hurriedly uh, checks out the items and, and hurries up to the father in order to catch them, and, and the shopper uh, taps the dad on the shoulder, and, and the dad is just getting done saying, Billy, we're, we're done. It's going to be okay now, and the other shopper taps the dad on the shoulder and said, sir, I can't help but have watched you over these last few minutes and how you handled things amazingly with little Billy. You were amazing with little Billy, and, and dad says, you don't understand. I am Billy. This is not my story, okay? I promise. It's going to be fine. Parenting is hard. Parenting is difficult. And being a father is hard. And this is not in any way discounting mothers. Like, we know that mother's job is, let's just be honest, dads, is way harder than, mo- or than father's. But being a father brings its own level of, of difficulty. And so we want to just dive into this morning a story that we find about an amazing father in scripture, and that's found in John chapter 4. See, this is, this is we, we can identify with and, and connect with this a little bit today in John chapter 4. If you've ever been in this place where you've been in a difficult spot because of something your kids are going through, hopefully you can connect with this story here a little bit. Let's read this t- together. John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 43 through the end of the chapter. It says this, After two days, he meaning Jesus, he left there for Galilee. Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When they entered Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him because they had seen everything he did in Jerusalem during the festival, for they also had gone to the festival. And then he went again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son was ill at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. Go, Jesus said to him, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said to him and departed. And while he was still going down, his slaves met him, saying that the boy was alive. And he asked them uh, at what time he got better. Yesterday at seven in the morning, the fever left him, they answered. The father realized that uh, this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, your son will live. Then he himself believed, along with his whole household. This, therefore, was the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, I'm so thankful for this day. Uh, And just thank you for this opportunity that we get to be here together, that we get to dive into your word. And I pray that as as we spend these next few minutes looking at this story uh, of this father and his interaction with Jesus, that you would... Uh, open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to every one of us this morning, God. I pray that uh, we would be listening for where you are leading us and you're challenging us and you're convicting us, Father, and that, um, and that we would follow wherever you challenge us to go from here. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, and it's in his name that I pray this. Amen. And so we have this interesting interaction here between Jesus uh, and, and this man, this, this kind of nobleman, this royal official. And, and there's not much that we know about this individual, honestly, uh, but, but here's kind of some things that we do know. We, we know that he was some sort of official. He was a nobleman. He was possibly even a member of the royal family, maybe even a, a family to Herod Antipas. He had servants, and so we can assume at this point that he was fairly wealthy. Uh, he was a father. His son was so sick that, uh, that the man feared that his son would die. Wealth and social status aren't enough to keep disease away, even in the first century. 
And all that became secondary. Wealth and status and, and position became secondary to his child's health and, and well-being. John includes here, the writer John includes several interesting details in the story. Uh, most important, I believe, is, is that this is the second mirac- miraculous sign or miracle performed by Jesus uh, during this kind of series of seven signs uh, that, that John outlines here. This, is, this was intended, John says later on, to uh, bring people to faith who hear about these signs. And so I, I, I think this sign specifically teaches us some important lessons about faith in its various forms. Some good, some bad, but in this story, uh, we see four levels of faith that maybe each one of us in some way, shape, or form can identify with this morning. And so let's kind of work through these four levels of faith together. Faith level number one, the miracle-seeking faith. Faith level number one is the miracle-seeking faith. For some, this may be the starting point for real faith, but oftentimes, I, I believe it's a dead end for us and for many people. Oftentimes, it's a dead end. This faith is built on the foundation of just continuing to uh, need to see miracles performed around you. And really, that's what, what propels you. That's what keeps you going. And it only lasts, your faith really only lasts as long as the miracles keep coming and you keep seeing God do, you know, these big things around you. We don't say this out loud, right? But, but this is ultimately, when you break it down, this is ultimately what this looks like. We say, God, what have you done for me lately? God, what have you shown me lately? God, how have you changed my life lately? A couple things happened here towards Jesus that we should note. First thing is this, the locals in Nazareth, the locals in Naz- Nazareth, didn't much think of Jesus as anything special. They didn't think of him as, as anything great. A, a prophet has no honor in his own country, Jesus says in verse 44. And, and the second thing plays into that, and that is in Galilee, things were different. His status was different. His, the, the public opinion and view of him was, was different. Uh, they had heard of the miracles that he had been doing, and they wanted to see more. They wanted to see more of this. In verse 48, Jesus makes a comment here about the public view of him. And you can almost sense the, I mean, maybe it's not sarcasm, but I would sure, (coughs) excuse me, sorry, I would sure take it as sarcasm, which is in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I'm not sure I want to have that directed at me necessarily, because what's wrong with miracle-seeking faith? What's wrong with this sort of faith? Well, two things. First, First is this, it's the foundation that's really built on testing God. Its foundation is built on testing God, like, like we are making almost a deal with God. God, you continue to, to wow me. God, continue to show me things, continue to do things for me, and I will do you the favor of believing in you. That's ultimately what this faith level is saying. It's completely upside down from reality. And the second thing is this. This, this faith is shallow, and it's easily deceived by easy manipulation, In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, Jesus warns us this way. He says, false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. This type of faith is never really enough. This type of faith is not enough. Having one demand follow another one, demanding a miracle after miracle, demanding a sign after sign. And I think this is why Jesus performed the miracles the way he did. Uh, the, The man wanted Jesus to come to him. Think about that. The the man said, Jesus, come with me and and heal my son. He wanted Jesus to come to come with him. Jesus chose to do this miracle from a long distance perspective, which leads us then to faith level number two this morning, and that is the casual faith. The casual faith. This faith is built on people who who pray and who worship uh, to get a nice break from their normal lives. This is the faith where you've got your, your, your faith on the weekend, your faith on Sunday morning as long as it doesn't conflict with anything else. But then the rest of the time, the rest of the week, uh, you are in control of your life. You are uh, Lord of your life. God has been pushed to the side. Here's the hard truth. We know people like this. You know people like this. And in fact, maybe you are one of these people. Some of us here in this room 
are like this. Church membership rosters are full of people with casual faith in their lives. And this, is, this may have been what the official's faith looked like before this situation. We, again, we don't know much. But what we know is that people with casual faith allow their faith to interact with their lives only in certain times. But what we see here in this man's life is a transition when life comes crashing down around him. When something traumatic, when something major takes place, your faith level begins to change. We don't, we don't know what the faith of the official looked like before this, but, but his son got sick to the point to where he felt there was nothing else he could do except go to this man named Jesus that he's been hearing so much about. Hopefully he can heal his son. And that leads us then to faith level number three this morning, which is the desperate faith. The desperate faith. And maybe, maybe you've been here. Maybe this is where you're at right now. This man approaches Jesus with this plea to, to heal his son. <clears throat> Jesus responds with the line about how <clears throat> everyone just is looking for a sign. And then it's like the official just didn't care about anybody else at this point. He, he, he says, I don't know anything about what other people are looking for here, but I want my son to feel well again, is what the man says. And then verse Verse 49, hear the plea in this. Hear, hear the plea in, this, in his words. Sir, come down before my boy dies. Come down before my, my boy dies. Notice the change in words here. Like if you have your, your Bible open there, look at the difference between verse 47 and verse 49 in the words that he chooses here. This is not just coincidence. Verse 47, he says, my son. He's using the word for son. In Greek, it's huos. Uh, it's a general word for son or, or child. It's so general, sometimes it's used for animals even. It's just kind of this general word. But then look in verse 49. He changes the word that he uses here to my boy, Padion. This is much more specific, and it's really much more emotional for the man. This is my little child we were talking about. Lord, come and heal my little child. Verse 49 is, is more emotional. It's a, it's a desperate plea from a man that has nowhere else to go. He has nothing else that he can do. And here's, here's the thing about desperate faith. It's only as good as its source. Desperate faith is only as good as its source. F faith without a reliable source is more superstition than faith. Faith is not about how strongly you feel or about how emotional your intentions are. Faith is not any of those things. Having faith is less about believing uh, harder and more about trusting the source more. I can have faith that the keys in my pocket are going to go out and unlock Steve's car and turn it on and I can drive away with it. I can have all the faith in the world that my keys are going to do that. But when I go out there and actually shove my key into his ignition and like mess something up, and he's going to be super happy about that, at best, I'm going to be disappointed, right? Probably, in reality, I'm going to be hauled off for trying to steal his car. Desperate faith in the wrong source will at best leave us disappointed. Desperate faith in the wrong source will at best leave us disappointed, and, and probably more realistically, desperate faith in the wrong source will leave us hurt more than we were before. This official went to the right place. He went to the right source, which leads then to the final faith level, faith level number four, which is the active faith. It leads him to have active faith. The official's desperate faith turns into active faith. In this moment, faith is always more than just having emotions. Faith is always more than just kind of feeling good or, or being emotional or having tingling feelings. It, it's not just about sweet words. It's not just about professions of sincerity. Look at what the official did here in this story. He went to Jesus. He pleaded with Jesus. He listened to what Jesus said, and then he took Jesus at his word. And he went and he did what Jesus said. Verse 50, Jesus says, go, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said to him, and he departed. Faith that saves for eternity and faith that sustains us in emergencies of life always produces positive action. Faith that sustains us always produces positive ac action. Active faith takes God at his word and obeys. Now, this story 
It doesn't end here. Like, this is not the end of the story. On the way home, the officials meet, uh, the, the servant of the official meet the, the official, uh, and, and they tell him what has been taking place and, and that the boy has begun to heal. And, and the official then asks about the timing. Something in his mind is just turning, like, like when, at, at what moment, at what time did he start to get better? And they say, well, 7 o'clock in the morning yesterday, and and the official is thinking, coincidence? I don't think so. There's no coincidence here. And then look at verse 53, the second part of that. Verse 53. It says this. Then he himself believed. After realizing the timing of the event, the official believed in Jesus. Hadn't he believed in Jesus before he turned and left? Or by taking Jesus at his word when Jesus told him to go. Sure, there's, there, at some level, there's a progression here, right? Like, like first, faith came out of desperation. Then secondly, the, uh, he believed in the specific event, in the word saying that the boy was healed. But then you look at, at kind of the third part of this progression here. It all changed when the official understood that Jesus was who he said that he was. It's... One thing to believe that Jesus answers my prayers of desperation or heals in times of emergency. It's another to to believe that he is Lord of my life. It's another to believe that he is is worthy of following in my life completely. And and this is the point that the official gets to in his life. He's not a miracle seeker anymore. He's not a man with casual faith. He's not a desperate father at this point anymore. He is a personal believer in who Jesus is. And here's what takes place around him. Active faith causes change. Active faith causes change in our lives. Active faith causes change around him. We see it in the official's life. His active faith caused change for him personally, and his active faith caused change in others around him as well. The official's change in life was contagious. He believed. He began to see Jesus as Lord, and his family followed suit. At this point, and it's at this point, um, and so many other points, where we see that this takes place. A man comes to Jesus, and the family follows, because the man's faith is contagious. Now, this is not guaranteed universally, It's not guaranteed that when a man uh, and a husband or a father comes to faith, it's not guaranteed that the family will always follow. But we know that after a certain point, we have no control over other people's actions and decisions around us. We can lead and love our families and point them towards Jesus, but sometimes they just don't don't follow. But we see that in this story, this man had such a contagious desire to follow Jesus that his family couldn't stay away. The deeper, more genuine, more sincere, more personal faith that we have, the more likely it is to rub off on other people around us. The more likely it is to rub off on our family around us. But if, if our family, if our spouses, if our kids see an inconsistent, a compromising, a shallow faith, that, ha- that has little appeal, that has little value for them, they don't want to follow that. So where do you land in this? Where do, you, where do you land in these, these faith levels? Where is your faith? Do you have, do you have the miracle-seeking faith? Like, let's just be honest with ourselves here this morning for a moment. Do you have the miracle-seeking faith, faith, just looking to see what God can do for you? God, how can you fix my problems? How, how can you give me a good life that I want? How, how can you do these things for me? Are you, are you at the place of miracle-seeking faith? Or is it the casual faith? where you come on the weekend in order just to kind of feel the emotions of what's taking place, but, but Jesus and God doesn't interact with your life once you leave the church building on Sunday mornings. Or maybe you're in a des- place of desperate faith, where you're clinging to Jesus because you are so desperately in need of him to help you with something, to fix something, to heal something, to, to provide for something. Or are you in the place of active faith? Are you in the place where where you are actively living out your faith and allowing it to change your life and allowing it to change the lives of people around you? Where do you land? Where is your faith? At at one level, this is is bigger than just conversation for fathers. Like, I think all the mothers in the room would just like to think, think, yeah, this is 
this is great for dads to hear. I don't have to deal with this, right? But, but in reality, this is not just for dads. This is for everyone. This is for everyone who claims to follow Jesus. This is for everyone who claims to be a believer. Any faith level outside of active faith will not sustain you, church. Any faith level outside of active will not sustain you. It will let you down. You will end up hurt and disappointed, possibly forever. But, but we can take steps towards active faith. Each one of us can take steps by, by just simply listening to where God is leading us and then going where God leads us. Listen to him call us to get more involved. Listen to him call us to join a study or to serve somewhere or to start a study with somebody or, or to begin leading your children towards Christ or leading your family towards Christ or a number of other different things that Jesus can call us to. Listen to where he is calling you and then step out and go. That's active faith. We move to active faith by hearing where God is leading and then following that leading. And our active faith becomes more natural for us over time. It becomes more common for us. And and ours and other people's lives around us are changed and influenced because of our active faith. Where do you land? Where is your faith this morning? And then, because it wouldn't be Father's Day if I didn't like talk to dads, right? So... Dads, can I, can I just talk to you for a moment? Fathers, grandfathers, can we just talk for a moment? I, I want to put an extra emphasis on this. And this bears heavy with me. Throughout Scripture, we see that the role of leading the family towards Christ falls on fathers. And we know that while historically, sometimes mothers, grandmas, and other people have taken on the role of spiritually leading our families, that's not how God intended it. They step in because, because men are dropping the ball a lot of times, because men decide, well, I don't know how to do this, so I'm, I'm just going to not do anything. But statistically, we know and, and we can show that when a father is leading the way in faith, the family follows more times than not. Here's some numbers for you. Studies show that that if children come to faith first in a family, 3.5% of families will follow if children come to faith first. If mom comes to faith first, 17% of families follow. But if dad comes to faith first, if the father comes to faith first, upwards of 93% of families will follow. Feel the weight of that, dad. Let that sit on your shoulders here just a little bit. Much is riding on fatherhood, now more than ever. The faith of our families is riding on how we, as dads and fathers, are living out our faith in our lives. Dads, dads, your your job is so important. Your job is so important. You are so important. Our culture, more and more as the years go on, is full of fatherless families, as far as, far as excuse me, full of, of split families, of absentee parents. Your role, dads, in the family is so important that it can determine the direction your kids will go for the rest of their life in relation to their relationship with God. And it can greatly <coughs> influence the faith of your children and your wife, dads, Feel the weight of this. Be challenged by this, but be encouraged in this. Be empowered in this. No matter where you are at, no matter where your faith level is, Jesus is calling you to take a step further towards him and lead your family closer to him. This is our role, dads. Don't stay in one place because you just simply don't know what to do. Dads, ask for help. Get involved in ministry. Serve in the church. Join a small group or a study. Study more. Have conversations with your family. Pray with your family. And point your life towards Jesus. And the impact that you'll have on your family will be great. Dads, where is your faith level? Church, where is your faith level? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for these words. Thankful for these words and this example um, from John that that connect that can connect so much with where we are at. I, f- I pray for each one of us that we would 
not be okay with just floating through on, on some light level of faith, but God, we would be challenged, we would be convicted, we would be empowered to step out and to have active faith following you no matter where you lead us, God. God, I pray for the dads in this room and the fathers and the grandfathers that, that you would challenge us and convict us Give us the strength and the courage to step out and lead our families, lead our wives the way that you have designed for us to do. God, give us the strength and the courage to step out and no longer just be passive, but actively do what it takes to lead our families towards you. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us on the cross. Thank you that we can continually lean into him no matter, uh, no matter what's going on around us, God. We thank you, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray.